Good evening, everyone. Well, it's that time again. It's time for our Wednesday night Bible study. Let me introduce ourselves to you again. I am Reverend Dr. G. Rodney King, and I'm here with my lovely wife, Janet King. Hi. And we're going to continue our Wednesday night Bible study. I hope everyone is doing well. You're staying safe. You are practicing social distancing. You are wearing your mask when you go out. And when you come back in, you're washing your hands for at least 20 seconds. You know, with what's going on right now, if you've been paying attention to the news, you know we're kind of having a spike in the coronavirus. Yeah. And it's happening with ages 18 to 40 now. You know, when it first started out, anybody that we're talking about people over 65. Mm -hmm. But if you notice what's ha happening now, the younger people are starting to be more infected with this virus, 18 to 40. And if you stop and think about it, you know, when I was working out today, God reminded me of something. If you think about what Donald Trump is doing, the president of these United States who refuses to wear a mask, who thinks this thing is a hoax, he got on the news and talking about, oh, it's going to be over with in two to four weeks. We're going to be all right. We're going to be fine. And the, and the vice president is echoing the same words. It reminded me of what God did to Pharaoh. You know that every time Moses went back to Pharaoh to say, let my people go, God hardened his heart and he refused to let the people go until we got to plague number 10 of killing all of the firstborn. Mm. It reminds me, this is what Donald Trump is doing, because now he has said, if they don't reopen the schools by the fall, he's going to withhold funds from the schools. He's telling the people, and he doesn't believe his experts, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burke, and some of the other healthcare experts are saying, no, we're not out of the woods. As a matter of fact, we should be going back to phase one. We're not ready for the schools to be open. As a matter of fact, we're even thinking about closing some businesses down. He doesn't agree with his own people. They're in conflict. And I believe what's happening is God is hardening his heart so the people can really see that this man is, sorry, an idiot. He is an egotistical, maniacal maniac. And I believe that God is hardening his heart because he's making all these threats about what he's going to do if they don't open up the schools and they don't open up the economy and they don't open up this and that. And he's believing that this thing is going to be over with in a few weeks. It's not. They don't have a vaccine for this thing yet. And to put these children in harm's way of saying, if you don't open the schools and let them go back to school, I'm not going to fund your districts. That is totally ridiculous. Well, even if he does force them to open up the schools, the parents still don't have to send their kids to school. And the teachers certainly don't want to put their lives at risk by coming. Because we know even teachers, even the nurses and the doctors who are being exposed, the first responders that are dealing with these people are getting sick. What is it going to take for this man to wake up? Well, I just had that thought. God is hardening this man's heart so everyone can see what we're dealing with. And I deplore you, please, if you're not registered, get registered. We have to vote this year. If there's ever been a time in American history where we needed uh, everybody to vote, this is the time. We've got to get rid of this idiot. We've got to put somebody else in office that's going to really be concerned about the people, our children, and everybody. And get rid of this systemic racism, prejudice, bigotry, and hatred. And we know that he is a racist. So please, if you don't know, if you know somebody who's not registered, get them registered. If you know somebody who can't get to the polls, take them to the polls, because we've got to get rid of Donald Trump. Amen. All right, that's my spiel for the night. Let's get into our Bible study. We've been talking about the love of God. And I want to digress for a minute, because I kind of rushed through the last part of last week. So get your Bibles. 
Get your pen or pencil and a piece of paper, and we're going to go back to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We're going to start there and cover the first five verses of 1 John chapter 5. Okay, so it reads, Whoever believes that Jesus Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him, who is begotten of him. Everyone who believes, adheres to, trusts, and relies on the fact that Jesus is Christ, the Messiah, is a born-again child of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him, his offspring. So, notice what it says. Everyone, whoever you are who believes, who adheres to them, who trusts, who relies on the fact. It's not a theory, it's a fact. It's been proven that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the prophesied one, mm -hmm. is a born-again child of God. Amen. But he's a born-again child of God because he believes that Jesus is the Christ. And look what it says. And everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him, his offspring, Jesus Christ. Remember in John, I believe it's John 14 and 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And here's the second part. And no one can come to the Father but by me, or in other words, through me. So you can't bypass Jesus. You've got to go through him to get to the Father. So you can't claim that you love God, but you don't love his son. Amen. Huh? You've got to love Jesus. You've got to love the one begotten of him. Verse 2 says, listen, by this, by the fact that we know that Jesus is the Christ and we love him and God, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. By this we come to know, recognize, and understand that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commands, orders, charges, when we keep his ordinances and are mindful of his precepts and his teaching. Listen. Our love for God is proof that we love God. Our love for God, our love for his followers are proof that we love God. Amen. You have to start somewhere. You start, you actually you start by loving Jesus Christ because you just can't get to the Father. You love Jesus Christ, you love the Father, now you can love his followers your fellow believers, okay? That's proof that you, it says, that's why it says, by this. And then what it says, by this, we understand, we recognize mm -hmm. that we love the children of God. Here's the caveat. When we love God and obey his commandments, his orders, his charges, when we keep his ordinances and we're mindful of his precepts and teachings. In other words, they're in the forefront of our minds. It's not an afterthought. Amen. It's a forethought. We always put God first. first. Let me ask you a question. When you wake up first thing in the morning, what do you say? Mm -hmm. you. When you, The first thing you do when you wake up first thing in the morning, do you wake up saying, thank God? For another day. Or do you say, oh God, it's another day. <laughs> ah, you didn't get that. Do you say, thank God for another day? Or do you say, oh God, it's another day? See, one is positive. One, you're thankful to God for him waking you up. It wasn't your alarm clock. It was the finger of God, the love of God that woke you up. And you're glad to have another opportunity to praise him. Or do you wake up saying, it's a, oh God, it's another day. You're, you really hate that it's that day. You got to get up. You got to go to work. You got to face these idiots and that crazy boss and all the other things that go on in life. 
you're not really thankful. So how do you wake up in the morning? Do you wake up thanking God? Do you wake up praising God? Do you wake up giving glory to God for blessing you to see another day? Is it the forethought in your mind to give God thanks for another day? It should be. Amen. Huh? It should be. So God should be the forethought in your mind. As a matter of fact, not only should you say that, but you should show you should ask him to be able to help you to glorify him Amen. throughout the day. Huh? No matter what may come, you should pray to have him glorify help you to glorify him throughout the rest of the day. So it's something that we should keep in the forefront of our minds. Verse 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For the true love of God is this, that we do his commands keep his ordinances, and are mindful of his precepts and teaching. And these orders of his are not irksome, burdensome, oppressive, or grievous. See, don't pretend like you love him. Don't be a phony. Don't be a hypocrite. You know what a hypocrite comes from the word hypocrisy or a play actor is someone who puts on a face to pretend like there's somebody else that they're not really. Well. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't pretend. See, because here's one thing you can't do. You can't fool God. Amen. He knows whether you're being for real. You know how the kids say, keep it real, keep it 100. You got to keep it real because he knows whether you really love him or not. He knows whether you're going to obey him or not. And he says that keeping his commandments are not what? Burdensome. They're not hard to do. Okay? They're not grievous. They're not irksome. They're not troubling. It's easy if you love somebody. Well, let me use something that we can understand in the natural. If you truly loved your parents, and young people, I hope you're listening too. If you truly love your parents, you're not going to want to do anything that's going to hurt your parents. You're not going to want to do anything that's going to disappoint your parents. So if we have that love for our parents that we want them to be proud of us, that we want to love them for all that they've done for us, we ought to have twice that much love for God. We ought to be wanting, willing to be obedient to love him as much as possible for what he has done for us for all the many blessings and benefits he has showered on us we ought to want to love to keep his commandments and beside remember i told i think i told you this last week a week before you have a choice in deuteronomy 28 it talks about the blessings of obedience mm -hmm. Blessed will you be in the field, well, and blessed will be the fruit of well, your body. Blessed will be the fruit of your cattle. Yeah. Blessed will you be when you go out. Blessed will you be when you come in. Blessed, blessed, blessed. It's just all blessings. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. And it all comes from being obedient, following his word. On the other hand, further down in that same chapter, and you can read this on your own. Read 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. It says these curses mm -hmm. will come on you if you are not obedient. All the blessings that it talked about will just apply the curses to all of that other stuff. Mm -hmm. You'll be cursed with your body, cursed in your cattle, cursed in your business, cursed in your children, cursed when you come in, cursed when you go. Wow. I mean, you got the choice. Hello. Huh? You have the choice. Now, which ones do you want? Mm. Do you want God's blessings or do you want God's curses? Mm. Well, I don't know about you, but I want him to bless me as much as he wants to bless me. Amen. Bless me abundantly. As a matter of fact, bless me exceedingly, abundantly, above all I that I can ask or even think. Yes, yes, That's what yes, I want. Yes, yes. And you know what? It's not hard to do, not if you truly love him, because that's where it all stems from. Amen. Verse 4. I believe that's where we are, right? Mm -hmm. Look, it says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. 
For whatever is born of God is victorious over the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. For whatever, whoever is born of God is victorious over the world. Now, what does that mean? It means the world's system. Mm -hmm. You're not living your life according to the dictates of the world system. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen. Huh? You, you didn't get that. We are in the world. We're physically in this <clears throat> world, but we're not of the world. We don't act. We don't think. We don't do what the world does. And, you know, for that reason, the Bible calls us peculiar. Mm -hmm. We're peculiar people because our thought processes is not the way the world thinks. See, because in the world, if you do something to somebody in the world, they're going to try to do something back to you. Amen. If you say something or cuss somebody out in the world, they're going to try to cuss you back. But the Bible tells us, do good to those that don't do good to us. Mm -hmm. Pray for those that despitefully use us. Mm -hmm. It, it tells us to bless them that curse you. Yes. See, that's not the world's way of thinking. The world says, if you do something to me, I'm going to do something back to you. I'm yeah. going to get back at you. But see, we are peculiar people. We are a royal priesthood. Yes. We've been born of God, so our nature is changed. The way we think, the way we act is different. And they look at us like, wow, how could you do something like that? Well, well it's not really me. It's the Holy Spirit that's in me. It's the Holy Spirit that's controlling me. Yes. It's the love that I have because I want to be obedient to my Father. Yes, yes, yes. Now, let me tell you something. This wasn't easy, not even for me. I had to learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. I had to learn how to let go. I had to learn how to move Rod out the way. Huh? Because I had that, well, had that same attitude that the world had. I had to learn. This is a growing process. Yeah. It does not happen overnight. It takes practice. Yeah. You get better and better at it. You learn how to let things roll off of you like water off a duck's back. Mm -hmm. Because you know why? Because you know God is going to take care of you. You know that you're going to win in the end. Huh? So it says, it says, whoever is born of God is victorious over the world. And this is the victory. Just this something simple. Mm -hmm. And this is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. Even our faith. Our faith in God that he's not going to disappoint us. Amen. That he's not going to let us lose. Oh, you know what? Sometimes we need to cheat and read and go back to the end of the book. Because uh -oh. when you go to the end of the book, you'll find out we've got the victory. Amen. Amen. You go to the end of the book, you'll find out that we won the war. Yes. You go to the end of the book and you'll find out that we made it through. Yes. See, so if you're not sure, cheat a little bit. Go to the end of the book and see what rewards we're going right, to get. All right. You know what we're going to be. And I'll tell you something. Jesus made us a promise. I don't know if you realize that, but he made us a promise. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Mm -hmm. First of all, he said, in my father's house of many mansions. And if it wasn't so, I would have told you in the first place. He said, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, guess what? Here's the promise. I will come back and receive you unto myself that what? That where I am, there you will be also. That's a promise. That's the victory we have. And you've got to have faith to believe that is true. Yes. That's the victory that overcomes That's the world. The Even our faith. That no, we're going to win in the end. Huh? Let me finish with verse 5 and then we're going to move on. Who is he who, believe, who overcomes the world? Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Who is it that is victorious over that conquers the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, who adheres to, trusts in, and relies on that fact. Here's how you get the victory. Here's how you conquer 
the world, as I just said. You believe that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. And guess what? You also believe that he came, and you got to make this personal, that he came and died for your sins. Yes. See, you put your name there. Yes. He didn't just come to die for the world. He came to die for G. Rodney King. Mm -hmm. He came to die for Janet King. Yes. He came to die. Whatever your name is, put your name there. He came to, if there was only one person, he came. Hmm? Thank you. if there was only one person that he had to die for, you ain't getting this. Hallelujah. You ain't getting this. You, if it was just one person, if it was just you, he would have come to yes. die just for Thank you. you. Thank you, Jesus. That's the kind of love. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Mm -hmm. Believing that Jesus is the Christ. Mm -hmm. Huh? That he is the son of God. All right, we're going to move on. Let's now go to uh, the fifth chapter of Romans. Let's go to the fifth chapter of Romans. Okay? And we're going to start at the first verse. The fifth chapter of Romans. All right. So it says, therefore. Now, put your finger there because if there's a therefore, that means something came before the therefore. So we need to find out what the therefore is there for. So that means we've got to go back. So let's go back. Put your finger there at the fifth chapter. And let's go back one chapter to the fourth chapter of Romans. And let's go, starting at, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let's go to the 13th verse. Okay? Romans 4, 13. Let's back up for a minute because we need to find out what that therefore is there for. Mm -hmm. Starting at the 13th verse of that fourth chapter of Romans, it says, For the promise, now you got to remember the promise. God had made Abraham a promise. He told him that if he leave his, his people, his country where he was, that he would make him a father of many nations. He would make his name great and make him the father of many nations. Mm -hmm. So that's the promise he gave him. So it's, in this chapter, it's talking about the promise. The promise granted through faith. We already just talked about faith. So let's see, it says, 13th verse says, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Read that, Janet. For the promise to Abraham or his posterity that he should inherit the world did not come through observing the commands of the law, but through the righteousness of faith. See, the promise that God made to Abraham and his prosperity that it would inherit the world was not because he would observe the law, because it wasn't about the law. It was about his faith in God. Amen. God told him that if you do this, if you trust me and believe in me, by faith, you're going to get these things. Mm -hmm. Not observing the law, it was his faith to believe what God had told him. Verse 14 says, For if those who are of the law are heirs, check this out, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, then faith is made futile and empty of all meaning, and the promise of God is made void or annulled and has no power. Listen, if the inheritance of the law, huh, who are to be the heirs, then faith is made futile. It's nothing. It doesn't mean anything. It's Amen. empty. It's Amen. devoid. It has no power. Uh -huh. if, if, if you're believing what you're going to get is through observing the law, then what you need faith for? Mm. Huh? It's empty of all meaning and promise of God. It's made void and is annulled and has no power. Because you're depending on the law and not on faith in God. Huh? All right. Verse 15 says, 
Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. For the law results in divine wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression of it either. See, the law can't save you. And there, first of all, we talked a few weeks ago. God only gave one command. He told Adam and Eve not to eat from the fruit of that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One command. And he had a law. He established a law. He told them, the day that you eat from that fruit, from that tree, you will surely die. Until that, they had not transgressed. There was no sin. It, it's just like today. We have laws in our country. And if you disobey that law, you're subject to be punished. But until there's a law established, there is no punishment. Huh? Right. So you got to understand, the law can't save you. The law was given for your guidance and correction. So what it's saying here is that for the law results in divine wrath. God has made a law. He's not going to change his mind about it. He told them the day that you eat from that tree, you shall surely die. Well, first of all, they didn't die physically. They went on to live, but they died spiritually. They were cut off from God. And you know what? They knew it because what did they try to do? They tried to hide themselves in the bushes. They made fig leaves for themselves and tried to hide when God came and called them and said, Adam, where are you? Not that he didn't know. He said, well, we hid ourselves because we knew that you, we had messed up, basically. God told them, I did not tell you not to eat from that tree. And here comes the blame game. Mm -hmm. first, God, first, Adam blamed his wife. The wife now blamed the serpent. Well, all of them got punished. Huh? They all got punished. So what I'm trying to tell you is this. If there is no law, there is no transgression. But here's the bottom line. The law can't save you. It can't save you from the wrath of God. But we had to have something to save us from Adam and Eve's transgression. And that Savior is Jesus. Amen. Amen. That Savior is Jesus because the Bible tells us, I believe it's in... Uh, Psalms 23, no, 3 and 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now you say, how is that possible? Because we inherit the sin nature of Adam. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There had to be a way for us to be reconciled and brought back into peace and a relationship with God. And that was through the blood of Jesus Christ. Huh? The blood of Jesus Christ, that was our way back in. But there, this law, we, it doesn't save us from the wrath of God. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. All right, so verse 16 says, Therefore, come that word therefore again. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. Ooh, that's a good word. So that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Therefore, inheriting the promise is the outcome of faith and depends entirely on faith in order that it might be given as an act of grace which is unmerited favor, to make it stable and valid and guaranteed to us, to all his descendants, not only the devotees and inheritance of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, who is thus the father of us all. So look, this inheritance, just like we inherited Adam's sin nature, we, we didn't ask for it, we inherited it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we were born with it, all right? It says, if we inherit the promise, 
the outcome of faith, and it depends entirely on faith. Not on observing the law, but entirely on faith. In order that we might be given as an act of grace. Grace is unmerited favor. We didn't do anything to earn it. We weren't good enough to receive it. It's just that God gave us grace. Un, that's what unmerited. If it was merited, it wouldn't be grace. If you did something to earn it, it wouldn't be grace. It's unmerited favor. It was given to us simply because God loved us so much and he wanted to give it. It says to make it stable and valid and a guarantee. Man, it's nothing like a guarantee. You know, have you ever got those lifetime guarantees? Uh, no matter how old that car is or that appliance is or whatever it may be, if it's got a lifetime guarantee, it could be 100 years, you could take it back and they have to fix it or replace it. Give you a new one. Hey, thank you. Give you a new one because it's got a lifetime yeah. guarantee. Guess what? We've got a lifetime guarantee. Mm. Uh, we've inherited a lifetime guarantee guarantee that we've been saved all the descendants and through Abraham not only to the devotees and adherents to the law those that are still trying to observe the law but also to those who share the faith of Abraham that's us that includes us see before it was just the Jews it was just for them but now the veil of the temple has been torn. Anybody, all of us can be accepted, Jews and Gentiles alike. That's uses. That's wins. Yeah, I know that's Ebonics, but you get my point. We've all inherited this. It's the faith of Abraham and now who has been imparted to us, who is the father of us all through faith. Because of his faith, it's been passed on. It's, we have now been engrafted into the family. The Bible tells us that we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And whatever he has, whatever inheritance he gets, we get it too. You're no longer treated like a stepchild. You're just like part of the family. Because you've been blood washed and blood bought. Thank you, Jesus. Huh? We're part of the family now. Thank you. Thanks be to God. So verse 17 says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. It don't say Jewish nations. It says I've made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who believe. He who believe. God who gives life. We always talk about God giving. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Mm. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He was appointed our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and speaks of the non-existent things that he has foretold and promised as if they already exist. Listen, listen to that. Are you getting this? As it is written, he's talking to Abraham, I have made you the father yes. of many nations. He's telling this before he even left. Huh? He's telling, I've already made you a father of many nations. Yes. As he appointed us, him, our father. In the sight of God, there's no one else God could have sworn by more than himself. Amen. Huh? There's no authority, nobody, no higher power than he could have sworn by than himself. When he made this covenant with Abraham, there was no one else higher than him. He made that covenant. That's a promise. That's a like a testimony. That's like a, uh, um, what do you call that thing when, you, when somebody leaves it? A will. Mm -hmm. It's a will. Living trust. It's a living trust. There's no other authority or power higher than God. When he made that covenant, that promise, that will with Abraham, he said that this is what's going to happen. If you just trust me, if you just have faith in me, this is what's going to happen. He appointed him by, he says, as he was appointed our father in the sight of God, mm -hmm. in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead. Huh? Because remember, he wasn't physically dead. Abraham, I'm speaking of. But he considered himself, he considered his body dead because he was now, what, 100 years old. Mm -hmm. 
and even the deadness of his wife, Sarah, who was 90 years old. Because remember, God made him a promise that you were going to have an heir. You're going to have an offspring. And he can see, he said, what? I'm 100 years old, and my wife is old too. But the Bible said he staggered not at the promise of God, but was strong in faith. And believe God that what he said he was also able to perform. Because look what it says here. Who gives life to the dead and speaks of the non-existent things. Things that had not even come to pass yet. The non-existent things that he has foretold and promised as this they already existed. You see, in God's mind, it already existed. It wasn't no... Like maybe it's going to happen or perhaps it will happen. In his mind, he already saw it as existing. Huh? It's already done. He called those things that be not as though they were, as though it's already happening. Listen, a lot of times when God makes us a promise, we have to wait on it. But the Bible says, in, I believe it's Hebrews 11 chapter. Now faith is the substance of the things hoped for. I don't have it yet, but it's the substance. The, my faith is the substance. That's what I'm holding on. It's the evidence of the things not seen. Listen, my faith is the substance and it's the evidence that I'm going to get those things that I have been praying about. So when somebody asks you, well, how do you know you're going to get it? Because my faith tells me I am. It already exists in God's mind. I'm just waiting for the manifestation of it. And I'm going to keep confessing it until it happens. Huh? Because I'm trusting God. I'm believing God. And he told me that I would never be disappointed. And I would never be frustrated. I would never, he would never leave me or forsake me. So my faith is the substance. It's the evidence of those things, I got it. I'm just waiting for it to come. Yeah. And I'm going to keep trusting him until it comes. Now, let me say this. Make sure when you ask him as God for something, you're asking in line with his will. Don't ask for something foolish. Don't say, Lord, make me a billionaire. Because if he don't think you can handle it, it's not going to happen. You've got to ask in line with his will. And how would you know that? Get into his word. You'll find it in his word. Let's go on. I believe we're at verse 18, right? Who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. For Abraham, human reason for hope being gone, hoped in faith that he should become the father of many nations as he had been promised. So numberless shall your descendants be. Huh. So what does it say again? What, what did that verse say again? For Abraham, for human reasons, hope being gone. I, I mean, I'm, not, I'm 100 years old. Hope being gone. But he said, hoped in faith yeah. that he would, should become the father of many nations as he had been promised. See, because naturally speaking, and you know, all of us look from our human point of view. Naturally speaking, he probably wondered, how in the world is this going to happen? I'm 100 years old and my wife is old. But he said, I'm going to stand on the promise of God. I'm going to believe. So against hope, he believed in hope. Yeah. Let me say that again. Against hope, he believed in hope that he would become the father of many nations. Well, we know the story. He did. Now, go down to verse, uh, go down to verse 23. Go down to verse 23. So it says, now it was not written for his sake alone. This wasn't written just for Abraham alone. That it, what, that it was imputed to him. I'm going to read 24. But also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Read that, Janet. Read 23 and 24. 
23, but the words it was credited to him were not written for his sake alone, but they were written for our sakes too. Righteousness standing acceptable to God will be granted and credited to us also. We believe in, trust in, adhere to, and rely on God who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So it wasn't just written for Abraham. It was written for his posterity. That's, yes, us. that's us. It was written so that we would believe, we could read the story of what happened with Abraham, and we could believe for ourselves. I, I'm going to tell you something. I know what's a living witness because I believed it when I was having, when I had my boys. Every time... I was getting ready to have another child. I would always believe and pray that for a man child. The question came, how do you know? Because I'm believing by faith that's what's going to happen. And it did. I believed it. And I trusted God that that's what he was going to bless me with. And he did. It said it's not written just for him. It was written for us. The righteousness, the standing acceptable God will be granted and credited to us also. Mm -hmm. Who believe and trust in, adhere to, and rely on God who raised Jesus Christ our Lord. We didn't see it. We haven't seen it. But we trust and believe that it happened because the word tells us so. And then verse 25 says, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Who was betrayed and put to death because of our misdeeds and was raised to secure our justification, our acquittal, making our account balance and absolving us from all guilt before God. He was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. Huh? And he was put to death because of our misdeeds, our mm -hmm. sins. Mm -hmm. He was put to death, but he was raised to, to secure our justification. There's three parts, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Mm -hmm. Well, the justification would happen when Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We were justified. We were uh, uh, found not guilty. Mm -hmm. We were set free. Yeah. Huh? We were acquitted. Mm -hmm. So that's justification. Now we should be in the category of sanctification, All right. which means we should be set apart for God's usage. Okay. We should be serving God. Say it, Jen. Declared righteous. We've declared righteous. Uh, we have right standing with yeah. God. We've been set apart for his work. Now, we get a little glorification now, but our future glorification will come at the rapture, if, if, if that happens before we die. Mm -hmm. But we're going to get these brand new bodies. We're going to get this celestial bodies. Thank you, Lord. That's going to be our glorification. Mm -hmm. We're going to be glorified mm -hmm. or have a glorified body just mm -hmm. like Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So the third part is still yet future. Mm -hmm. We just get a small inkling of it now through blessings and stuff. But that's nothing like what it's going to. The Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard the things which God has prepared for them that love him. We don't even know what it's like. We don't know what that body looks like right now. But I'm telling you, it's going to be glorified. Okay? So now we can go back to chapter 5. Now that we know what happened in chapter 4, because now we can go back to the therefore. So look what this first part says. Therefore, having been justified, we just talked about that. We've been justified. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, since we are justified, acquitted, declared righteous, and given a right standing with God through faith, let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of reconciliation to hold and to enjoy. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Therefore, since we are justified, I just said that, we've been declared not guilty. Yes. We've been acquitted of our sins, no matter how bad they were. It's like when you go to court, and a judge, they bring all these witnesses, and you're guilty, and you know you're guilty, and you're just waiting for the punishment. 
And then all of a sudden, somebody steps up and says, I'll take his place. And you're like, what? I'll take his place. Whatever punishment you were going to put on him, put it on me. Because that's what Jesus did. He said, put it on me. So the judge says, okay, I will. You're free to go. You're, you're not guilty. I guess you wouldn't say, nah, I don't like him. I, uh, uh, he white. <laughs> Come on. Come on. I wouldn't care what color he was. If I was getting ready to die, he wanted to take my place. Yep. Although Jesus was not white. But I wouldn't care if he was polka dot. <laughs> If he was getting ready to take my place, Man. do it instead of me, I would be joyous. Yes. We've been justified. Yes. We've been acquitted. We've been found not guilty. We are free to go. But hold on. Let me put a caveat there because the Bible tells us just because we've been justified does not give us grounds to sin. What does Romans say? I believe the sixth chapter. Shall we continue in sin mm. that grace may yeah, abound? Mm. Certainly not. Just because we've been set free don't mean we can go out there and be willy-nilly and do whatever we want to. Mm -hmm. We've been set free for a reason. The blood of Jesus has ransomed us. We owe a debt which we cannot pay. Mm. Huh? The only thing we can do is try to serve God with, for the rest of our life as best we possibly can. Amen. But we've been acquitted, declared righteous, and given right standing with God. Well, how much better could that be than know that you have right standing with God? He sees the blood of Jesus that's covering you. If you believe, he sees the blood of Jesus that's covering you. So it says, let us grasp this fact. Mm. Let us grasp this. That means let us take hold to it. Let's hold on to it. That we have the peace of reconciliation. Hold on to that. Mm -hmm. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Because of what Jesus did, we have reconciled been reconciled back to God. We have peace with God. The wrath of God is not going to come on us now. We're not going to be punished now. We're not going to be condemned to hell now. We're not going to have to be with Satan and his bunch now. We've been reconciled. We've yes. been redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord, of the Lord say so. Jesus. Yes, yes, We've been yes. deemed. We've been right. set free. Thank you. Thanks be to God. Yes, Lord. Thanks be Thank to God. You, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we're going to stop now. Yes, yes. But it's getting gooder and gooder. gooder but and now good. you can go ahead and read. We, we're going to be in Romans next week. we still just at the first part of Romans. So if you want to read, read. Uh, I believe we're going to cover about the first 11 verses of that fifth chapter of Romans. If you want to read a little ahead of time. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we still got some more stuff to touch on right now. But just thanks be to God that we've been set free. We've been redeemed. We've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Thank Christ. You, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. It can't get any better than that. Thanks be to God. Okay, we're going to stop tonight. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. We give you all praise. We give you all honor. We give you all glory. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for that sacrifice. Thank you, we thank you for your coming thank to die Jesus. on the cross yes, to justify Lord. us, yes, Lord. to acquit us, Bless to set you. us free, and to give us right standing you, with the Father. So now we are grafted into that family. You, now we've inherited the blessings and the promises of Abraham. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We can't thank you enough. If we had 24 hours of the day, it wouldn't be enough. If we had a thousand tongues, it still wouldn't thank be enough. You, but we just come to offer you as humbly as we are, to give you thanks, to give you praise, to give you honor, and to yes. give you glory you, for all that you're doing in our lives, through our lives, and for our lives. Yes. And see, we know that it's because of you, thank you that we live. That we move and that we have our being. Oh, we just thank you, Father. Bless you. We give you all the praise, all the, praise, all the honor, all the glory. Name, and Satan, Jesus. in the name of Jesus, we yeah, bind your we words. Have Principalities, have powers, power. rulers, and wicked spirits. We plead the blood of Jesus against yeah, you. And we're claiming you. the victory. Right now. Because we already found out just to have faith the is the victory. And we're claiming it right now yes, in Lord. the name of Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Thank God. Thank you. Father. And amen. Amen. Amen.
Be safe. Remember, this thing is kind of on the upsurge again. Be safe. When you go out, wear your mask and your face shield. Keep your hands covered if you can. Get some of those sterile gloves. Wash your hands when you come back in and be safe Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. I love you, but God loves you more. Amen. Have a blessed night.